Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. Welcome to Clinical Trials Talks, a podcast to get the conversation going. We know that clinical trials can seem scary and confusing. You might even feel a bit distrustful because of things that have happened in the past or because it's hard to find clear information. But luckily, researchers are working really hard to make sure that clinical trials are safe and fair. We're here to help you understand everything even better, to make things less scary, and to answer all of your questions. In this audio guide, Clinical Trials 101, we'll talk to Dr. Philip Mees, a rheumatologist and principal investigator on several lupus clinical trials. He'll walk you through some common questions about clinical trials for lupus to help you better navigate this potential opportunity for treatment. So come along with us as we explore everything you need to know about clinical trials. You're not alone, and we're here to help. Welcome, Dr. Meese. Thank you for joining us today. Sure, Susan. Thanks for having me on this podcast. To start this audio guide, Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in clinical trials? I have been a clinical researcher in the Seattle area now for a little over 25 years. I've had an opportunity to be involved with the development of many of the medications that are now being used in rheumatology and really have been significant breakthroughs for patients around the world. It's really exciting to be part of a trial because you know that you're having the opportunity to work with potential treatments and also having a chance to work closely with patients as they try the medication and we see whether or not it can be helpful as well as safe. Thank you. For those who are just new to this world, can we start by defining what is a clinical trial? Clinical trials, also known as clinical studies, are research studies that include human participants. These trials investigate how a study drug might act in the body and affect a disease. These studies make sure that the drug is safe for you to take. All study drugs are given to animals before they are tested on people. Thank you so much for that clear answer. Could you now please talk a little bit about the benefits of joining a clinical trial for lupus patients? Well, the benefits are many, and they include possible access to study medication that is not yet approved for your disease. An example of this is a medication known as ducravacitinib, or SOTIC2, which has been approved for the treatment of psoriasis and shown benefit and safety as well in a phase 2 trial in lupus and is in the midst of phase 3 trials for lupus. Close monitoring and care from healthcare professionals is something that happens in a clinical trial, contributing to medical research that may help your patient peers in the future. Clinical trials are crucial for lupus patients as they help researchers understand the disease better and aim to develop potential treatments. Participation in clinical trials can lead to advancements in medical knowledge and new therapies for lupus. Clinical trials are designed to help you possibly get closer to your goal of remission and be an option in your toolkit to feeling your best. Enrolling in a clinical trial is a decision that you should make in consultation with your doctor and your loved ones. And can anyone take part in a clinical trial? Participation in clinical trials is open to people of various ages and backgrounds. However, each research study has specific eligibility requirements based on factors such as age, gender, type, and stage of disease, previous or current treatments, and other medical conditions. Your eligibility will ultimately be determined by the study doctor. Every potential clinical trial participant must go through a screening process to ensure they meet the eligibility requirements. The screening process may include more than one visit. For example, uh, there is a period of pre-screening assessment. This initial screening may take place over a phone call, or you may fill out a questionnaire online. You'll be asked general information such as your age, race, preferred contact method, and to verify your contact details. You'll also discuss your current diagnosis as well as any comorbidities that you're living with that could exclude you from the study. You may also be asked about the medications you are currently taking. 
When filling out forms or answering questions, it's important to be honest. Don't answer based on what you think might make you eligible. The information you share is designed to help determine if the trial would benefit you. Then there's the screening appointment. If you pass the pre-screening, you'll be invited for an in-person evaluation. During this visit, the study team will explain the trial, ask you to review and sign the informed consent form, and discuss all inclusion and exclusion criteria. You'll also undergo a physical examination, which may include height, weight, temperature, blood pressure, and blood and urine tests. Additional tests may be conducted based on your medical history. The screening period will vary in the number of visits based on the study. A lot of our patients have some fears around clinical trials. What kinds of protections are in place for patients who join a clinical trial? Safety is the first priority in clinical trials. Trials are designed, conducted, and monitored according to local regulatory requirements, ethical principles, and international standards. Clinical trials are completely voluntary, and participants can leave the trial at any time for any reason. There is no penalty or fee of any kind for withdrawing. However, when withdrawing from the trial, the participant should let the research team know. Before you participate in a clinical trial, you will need to sign what is called an informed consent form, also called the ICF. This form reviews the purposes, procedures, risk, and benefits of the study. You will be given ample time to read through the ICF, ask questions to the study staff, and even take it home and think about it or review it with your loved ones. Can you explain the phases of clinical studies? Clinical studies are typically classified into four phases. Preclinical, which is when study medications are tested in the laboratory and on animals. Phase 1, which is when researchers test study medication for the first time in humans by giving it to a small number, typically 20 to 80 patients. And these can be either patients with a disease or healthy volunteers to evaluate how the drug works and identify potential side effects. Phase 2, this is when the study drug is given to a larger number of people, for example, between 100 and 300, with a particular disease or condition to further evaluate safety, side effects, and the drug's efficacy. Phase 3 is when several hundred to several thousand people with the disease or condition participate. The study drug undergoes additional testing to continue to assess safety, side effects, and efficacy, or how well the medication works, optimal dosage, and comparison to standard treatments. Phase 4 is often conducted after the study medication is approved and available by prescription. It's when researchers aim to understand the best way to use the study medication as a potential treatment and identify any other risk or benefits. Thank you. What are the side effects of clinical trials? Each person's experience in a clinical trial is unique. Some individuals may experience risk, while others may not. Study teams are keeping a careful watch on how you are doing when you participate in a clinical trial. Examples of potential risk include side effects by the study drugs. The study team will review this when you are reviewing the informed consent form with them. For example, if there have been any previous studies with the medication and some risk have emerged, then you will be advised of this before you even begin your study with the drug. Also, during the course of the trial, each time you visit or even if a risk or adverse effect arises and you need to let the study team know, then they are totally open and wanting to know about any such side effects during the course of the trial. There are also potentially study procedure risks, for example, risk caused by procedures such as x-rays, CT scans, or blood collection. And then there are unknown risks. As the study drugs are still being researched, there may be risks uh, that are not yet known that may arise. This is why the study medication is tested on animals before testing on humans. 
it's important to know that the testing on animals continues while we introduce these study medications to humans, so we have long-term information. That's also why it's important for you to communicate with your doctor about any side effects that you experience during a trial. Sometimes, a study medication may not improve your symptoms or put you in remission. This is why informed consents include a line that says there may not be any direct benefit to you from participating in a clinical trial, as researchers are still trying to determine if the trial drugs will have any positive effects. Many trials have a placebo cohort or arm in the beginning of the trial so that researchers can more reliably determine the efficacy and safety of a drug by comparing it to a placebo. These trials then allow patients to continue with the study drug for the remaining duration of the trial. It's just as important to know when a study medication works and should become a standard of care versus when we should go back to the drawing board. And finally, can you tell us a little bit about what happens after the trial is complete? When you finish a clinical trial, you may have many questions. Your clinical research coordinator and your own provider are the best people to help you plan what to do next. Even if a clinical trial is not working, it's important to finish it and stay in it. Staying in the trial provides valuable information that helps researchers understand the treatment's safety as well as how well it works, and this can potentially benefit you as well as future lupus patients. Thank you, Dr. Meese, for giving us such a patient-friendly overview of clinical trials. We hope this guide has helped ease some of your fears and answered many of your questions about participating in a clinical trial. If your lupus is not well controlled, clinical trials may be a way to explore another potential route. While it's not a guarantee, it may be a step toward taking better control of your condition. Talk to your healthcare provider to discuss if a clinical trial may be a possible option for you. This audio guide was made possible with support from Bristol-Myers Squibb. If you like what you heard, be sure to rate our podcast, write a positive review, and spread the word by sharing with your friends and family. It will help more people like you find us. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.